Eastern Europe finds itself at a turning point. The NATO militarization in the Baltics, the standoff in Ukraine and Russia's increasing internal complications are just a few of the geopolitical dilemmas the region will face in 2017. Given the volatility of the situation, a lot can go wrong. Unpredictable events will occur, such as a sudden death or an attack. Therefore, this analysis focuses on the trends. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Check out our fundraising page on patreon.com slash Caspian Report for perks and ways to support our channel. What has escalated the geopolitical standoff in Eastern Europe is NATO's eastward expansion, which Russia considers its sphere of influence. Any country will see a military buildup near its borders as a threat. This goes for Eastern European nations as well as for Russia. And herein lies the dilemma. No country will agree to concede its sovereignty or nationhood to others. Every government is looking to secure its own interests. It just so happens to be that the East European nations lack the resources to put up a fight against Russia and thus must seek for American involvement. Meanwhile, Washington's support in Eastern Europe creates a lot of anxiety in Moscow. As a result, the Russians feel a sense of urgency to strengthen their influences and buffer zones in the European plane. The Kremlin believes it must act now, while the country is still capable of doing so. In many ways, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Putin will seek to reverse Russia's fortunes. However, in doing so, he will encounter many obstacles. In 2017, the country will run out of funds due to low energy prices and the EU sanctions. Thus far, Moscow has dealt with the budget deficits by using its reserve fund. However, at the current rate of spending, the reserve fund, which stood at $87 billion in 2014, will run out in 2017. Putin could decide to use the capital reserve from the National Wealth Fund which as of September 2016 stands at $72 billion, but the National Wealth Fund is meant to support the pensions for Russian citizens. If the government uses the funds anyway, it would deprive its citizens of their social benefits. This would obviously upset ordinary Russians, and besides, Putin plans to run in the presidential election schedule for 2018. Therefore, using the National Wealth Fund is a last resort. Instead, the budget deficits could be balanced by privatizing state-owned companies. Last year, the privatization of Boshneft was announced. However, in 2017 or 2018, the largest oil company, Rosneft, could be next. Several Indian, Chinese and Japanese enterprises have already expressed interest in acquiring shares in Rosneft. However, such a decision would upset Sechen, the CEO of Rosneft and the second most powerful figure in the country. Yet, given the fact that Russia will deplete its reserve fund in 2017, Putin may have no choice but to go ahead and privatize Rosneft anyway. In doing so, he may also subsequently decide to take out Sechen and his FSB supporters by reforming governmental institutions. In any case, as resources continue to dwindle in Russia, the internal power struggle between the oligarchs, liberals, energy firms and regional governors will continue in 2017. But the current state of affairs cannot last indefinitely. In fact, one of Russia's objectives for 2017 will be to undermine the EU sanctions. At the present, the sanctions require an unanimous decision by the EU. To overthrow the status quo, Russia needs to convince just one EU member state to change its vote. Yet, thus far, the European nations have maintained a surprisingly coherent policy against Russia. Nevertheless, in 2017, Russia is likely to increase its lobbying efforts and once again seek to reach an understanding with nations such as Italy, Greece and Hungary. There is no guarantee that this plan will actually work, but Moscow's options are limited. The Kremlin will also try to reach a deal with Trump that halts the NATO expansion. More specifically, Putin will offer Trump the same deal he offered Obama, a geopolitical exchange, Russia's withdrawal from Syria in exchange for NATO's withdrawal from Ukraine. 
Geopolitical trade-offs are often done by manipulating the situation. For instance, the Russians could escalate the fighting in Syria, while at the same time they de-escalate the situation in Ukraine. This raises the willingness of the counterparty to trade, and whatever is decided, the locals will suffer. At the same time, Trump and Putin will also try to make peace as they call for a reset of relations. The two presidents will shake hands, smile, exchange gifts and maybe eat a hamburger or two, just as Obama and Medvedev did in 2009 when they reset the relations. Yet beyond the PR stunt, relations between the two will not improve. The fact of the matter is that the national interests of Russia and the United States contradict the personalities of their leaders. For instance, Trump has promised to lift the limits on oil production, which will allow for oil prices to remain low. This is the opposite of what Russia wants. It's these kind of discrepancies that complicate reconciliation efforts between Trump and Putin. Elsewhere in Eastern Europe, Washington is also expected to increase its financial and military support to Warsaw. For instance, recently an additional 4,000 American troops were deployed in Poland. Furthermore, the US defense budget for Eastern Europe has increased from 800 million in 2016 to 3.4 billion in 2017. Trump is unlikely to change the current arrangements, as doing so would upset his military advisors as well as the lobbies from the military-industrial complex. At best, the American president could refrain from responding directly and rather provide frontier NATO countries such as Poland and Romania with sophisticated defensive and offensive military technologies. Even if somehow Trump and Putin reach an understanding, Eastern European nations will do whatever is required to feel secure. Basically, we are witnessing the return of history. Poland, in particular, is bound to take the regional lead. In the coming years, the Polish leadership will seek to transform the Visegrad group into a political and military platform to counter Russia. The government in Warsaw will also push for an increased NATO presence in the country. In addition, within a few years, Poland plans to increase the size of its army by 50% and nearly double its military spending through 2022. These measures still fall short of competing with Russia, but it's an indication that Poland recognizes the need to adjust. In a way, the situation will resemble the 16th century, when Poland and Russia fought over a series of conflicts known as the Time of Troubles. And just like in the past, the Polish leadership will expand its relations with Ukraine and search for allies in the Baltics, as well as in Sweden, Finland and Romania. As for the conflict in Ukraine, it will continue to divide and cripple the nation. As a matter of fact, the Ukrainian leadership believes that the country will head towards even greater uncertainty in 2017. There are concerns in Kiev that Trump's negligence will embolden Putin to push further into Ukraine. This time, however, the speculated Russian invasion would target northern Ukraine. The Ukrainian crisis has also raised concerns in the Baltics. However, unlike Ukraine, the Baltic nations are part of NATO. Therefore, instead of overt action, the Kremlin will seek to launch covert operations by instigating ethnic tensions. A covert scenario can go down as the following. Russian minorities who make up roughly a quarter of the populations in Estonia and Latvia will start protesting. They will claim to be persecuted and ask for international protection. Meanwhile, riots, bombings and even assassinations will turn the region into a state of low-intensity conflict. Ultimately, such a scenario would allow for Russia to enter the region as a stabilizing factor. The most probable date to launch such covert operations would be during the World War II commemoration dates. For instance, in Latvia, the March and May commemoration dates are usually fueled with ethnic tensions, providing the perfect platform to launch covert actions. In the Balkans, ethnic tensions are also bound to increase following a controversial referendum in the Republika Srpska, which is one of the two legal entities in Bosnia. The Constitutional Court prohibited the vote, but it was conducted anyway. The referendum is a direct challenge to the Bosnian constitution, 
as it aims to assert the autonomy of the Serbian minority at the expense of the federal institutions of Bosnia and Herzegovina. There are now concerns that the Serbian officials can call for a secession referendum from Bosnia. Elsewhere in the Balkan region, tensions between Serbia and Kosovo have also risen following a train incident in January 2017. The scene occurred when a Serbian train painted in the colors of the national flag and inscribed with the message Kosovo is Serbia departed from Belgrade to Pristina. The train was denied entry to Kosovo and this set off a dramatic escalation as both sides had mobilized their military forces along the border. The situations in Bosnia, Serbia and Kosovo could spiral out of control, especially if outside forces start to intervene. Imagine Russia backing the Serbian position, as it has done historically, whilst Europe and America back the Bosnians and Albanians. In any case, in 2017, the Bosnian referendum and the Serbian train incident will bring back old memories of hostilities and stoke up ethnic tensions in the Balkans. Another region that will see a gradual shift in foreign policy is the Caucasus. In 2017, the Georgian leadership is likely to focus more on neighboring Turkey and Azerbaijan. The trilateral relations are expected to strengthen due to a number of regional activities. Take Azerbaijan's regional projects. In 2018 and 2020, two major pipelines will start operating. In 2017, another Azerbaijani project will come online, the Baku-Tbilisi-Kars railway. These economic undertakings will bolster the Turkish-Georgian-Azerbaijani coalition. Further in the Caucasus, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia will remain an unpredictable factor. Following the 2016 skirmish, diplomatic talks resumed but just as quickly stopped due to a political hostage crisis in Yerevan. Since diplomatic talks ceased, a new skirmish is likely to occur as soon as spring returns to the region. All in all, geopolitical predicaments are plentiful in Eastern Europe. And for this reason, it's important to note that there is no good or bad. It just is. Anyway, this was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. I want to express my gratitude to our amazing contributors on Patreon. And if you want to help expand our channel and content, please check out patreon.com slash report for perks and more information. And if you don't have the means, then I hope you continue to watch and share these reports. So take care and so